Welcome. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, for those joining in Asia and the Pacific, good morning. And for those joining from the US, good evening. My name is Dr. Huang Lai Tu. I'm the Principal Fellow at the Perth US Asia Centre. Uh, I've joined only recently, so I'm particularly excited to be uh, moderating this terrific uh, webinar with great panelists and a wonderful audience as well. So welcome to everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about new faces of all alliances as we look into power transitions and domestic politics um, uh, and an uh, evolving regional security environment, uh, particularly in the Republic of Korea, Philippines and Australia that all had recently their elections in recent months. So three out of uh, five Americans, Asia Pacific allies, um, uh, the Republic of Korea had election in March that elected uh, President Yoon sek yeol uh, In the Philippines in May, um, the country elected Ferdinand Bongo Marcos Jr. While in Australia also in May elected the Albanese government. Um, those are three very important allies for America. Uh, and uh, all of the wave of um, domestic change will be consequential for their po foreign policy and security outlook in the very fastly changing environment. So today with us to unpack all those questions and uh, talk about realistic expectations of those uh, US allies is the great panel, um, Professor Gordon Flake, our uh, Perth US Asia CEO and long-term watcher of Korea who needs no uh, introduction to this audience. Associate Professor Charmaine Malusha will be uh, is a professor at De La Salle University and uh, whose analysis you probably have heard or should have heard during the Filipino elections. Dr. Ian Henry is a senior lecturer at the ANU Strategic and Defense Studies Center at uh, ANU and author of the recent book, Reliability of an Alliance in the Interdependence, US and East Asian Allies um, in 1949 um, to 1969, Cornell University Press. And to provide uh, perspectives and expectations from the US, uh, particularly policies and plans under the Biden administration, we have Dr. Mike Green, who is known to uh, many of you are uh, working on Japan and US grant strategy, uh, but also recently joined the Down on the Crowd um, as the CEO of US Study Center at the University of Sydney. So those brief introduction, of course, don't give justice to the excellent um, careers of our ex uh, speakers, but you can find more of the bio in the webinar description. Um, for the uh, quick um, housekeeping, uh, let me start by saying that I'll invite uh, each of our speakers to speak about seven minutes uh, about their uh, take, main takeaway from the elections, their expectations um, and views on how the next phase of alliances will unfold. Um, and before we're going to uh, open up for uh, the audience participation in Q&A session, please uh, submit your question in the chat function and I'll be able to see them and moderate the discussion. Now, um, without further ado then, uh, Gordon, would you like to start us off uh, with um, telling us what about um, the recent the recent uh, takeaway from your your takeaway from recent uh, election in Korea? Tell us a little bit more about uh, President Yoon, as he's relatively unknown for outside of a Korean water. And um, what is his predisposition? How, what is his track record domestically? And what are your early assessments in these couple of months he's already been in the office? Gordon, please. Well, thank you, Huang. Um, this is a unique Perth US Asia Center event. I'm delighted to have uh, Huang doing the moderating. Uh, I think Huang's in Queensland right now. I'm in Melbourne and our colleagues are in Perth. So we're, we're attempting to have something approximating national reach in this conversation, but we're really honored to have Huang on board as our principal policy fellow. Uh, and I appreciate you organizing and moderating this event, Huang. Um, Korea, as, as many of you know, is a country that I've focused on for the better part of 35 years now. Uh, and and the, as a, a vibrant uh, democracy, um, and, and a democracy which has a single five-year term, something that is an outgrowth of, of, of a less than democratic period 
uh, in the 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, means that there, there's a lot more uh, transitions in, in the Korean uh, system than in, in many of the other democracies in the region where there's a lot more continuity between parties and, and uh, you get much more of a regular pendulum swing. Um, having said that, uh, in the election, on the presidential election in, in March 9th of this year, uh, there was the closest ever uh, results in a presidential election. Uh, President Yoon Suk-yeol from the People's Power Party won with the narrowest margin in Korean history. Um, and, and it marked a pretty much unexpected transition away from the ruling party, which had you know, the, the advantages of incumbency uh, and the opposition party or the conservatives had uh, had been largely considered to be out for a bit after you know the impeachment of the previous president, uh, Park Geun-hye, which led to the kind of the progressives being in, in position there. Just a note here for those of you who don't follow Korea closely, there have been two major parties for the better part of, of the you know the last 35 years in Korea, but they change their names all the time. Uh, but they're largely inheritors, one or the other. So the the People Power Party, which may sound like a progressive party, is the is the more conservative party in Korea. Um, and um, um, the interesting thing about the results in Korea that are worth noting are that um, it didn't break down in in the normal ways that you know you might anticipate in terms of what's happening in the United Kingdom or even Australia or the United States with kind of urban rural divides. Korea still has some pretty stark regional differences, uh, and so President Yoon won with strong vote. In, you know, in the traditional conservative heartland of the, the uh, Gyeongsang provinces, uh, in the areas around Seoul, Chungcheong provinces, um, and um, uh, Gangwon provinces, whereas the democratic heartland, if you will, the progressive heartland in the Southwest, uh, you know, carried very strongly in the Chela provinces and then some of the areas around Seoul, the suburbs around Seoul. So those divides were a little bit different than you might see in just a story about Korean history. Uh, Yoon suk yeol is, is very unknown in the world scene. Uh, in fact, I would probably say unknown in, in the, uh, the, the, the political slash think tank foreign policy scene as well. Uh, I think Mike Green can probably chime in on this as well. Uh, but previous Korean presidents were well known to uh, foreign policy experts in Washington, D.C. because they were part of a process and had gone through on a regular basis. Whereas President Yoon suk yeol is a prosecutor. He wasn't part of the normal political class, the name, the normal foreign policy class. Uh, and, and so it was a bit unknown coming into it. However, um, he, he has proven himself to be the inheritor of a long standing you know, um, set of relationships, that, what, what I would call the internationalists uh, in, in Korean foreign policy. And so of note, uh, the, the first two, three, four months of his, his presidency right now, have really gone well because the people that he's brought in with him, while he himself is relatively unknown, uh, the team around him is extremely well known. Uh, and so I'm just thinking about, you know, his the, the prime minister uh, is a two term prime minister, has had done it before previously. Han Duk Su had been previously ambassador to the United States. Joe Taeyong, uh, his his now ambassador to Washington, D.C., longstanding a member of parliament, uh, deputy foreign minister, had served numerous times in Washington, D.C., a uh, longstanding career as a diplomat in Korea. Pak Jin, the foreign, member, uh, foreign minister, uh, long ties to the United States, but also the region writ large, longstanding member of parliament, again, well known to everybody. Kim Ju Hyun, uh, former deputy ambassador in the United States and now head of the National Intelligence Service. Kim Sung Han, uh, in a... a, a, a academic from Koryo University, but also a longstanding experience in the foreign ministry is now national security advisor. So really, every one of his key foreign policy team are well known, have deep relationships in the United States, deep friendships in the region writ large, and a tremendous foreign policy cachet. So I wouldn't want to overstate uh, the, 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 the lack of familiarity of the president himself. He has a great team around him, and that's probably uh, characterized uh, his early days. Um, very similar to what I'm sure that Ian's going to be talking about, where uh, our prime minister, Anthony Albanese, has had a tremendous first six weeks just by dint of the international calendar. The same thing happened to, to President Yoon suk He was able to have a very early summit meeting 
with President Biden visiting Seoul, not, not him visiting Washington, D.C. the other round, was invited to attend the NATO summit um, uh, and has kind of signaled a very different approach to Korea. Here, I'll step back and, and, and talk a little bit about the progressive movement, um, because if you really want to understand the implications of the Korean political transition for relations with an ally, ally the United States, but also with other partners in the region like Australia, uh, there, there might be a on the face of it presumption that, oh, uh, we're, we're kind of star-crossed. On the one hand, we've got a very pro, uh, progressive administration in the U.S. and in the Democratic Party. We now in Australia have a progressive government, the, the Labour Party winning here. And at the same time, Korea has shifted to a conservative government. And it might seem that we're actually not coordinated, but the reality is exactly the opposite. Uh, the way I would describe it is Korea has shifted, at least in terms of foreign policy and international relations, to an internationalist government uh, as opposed to a more domestically focused government. And what that means is, is there's been tremendous overlap and complementarity uh, between the new incoming UN government in Seoul and the Biden administration and already uh, with the, the, the government here in Australia. And to understand that, you have to look back at the 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 democratic movement, the progressive movement in South Korea, going back 30 years, you know, 40 years, there were within the, the student movements that led to kind of democratization in Korea back in the 1980s, two major factions. Uh, and Koreans love to use acronyms to describe them, uh, the NL and PD. Uh, the NL faction is the National Liberation Faction, uh, which tended to focus very much on North Korea and uh, Korean identity and, and, and Korean history. Uh, and then the PD faction was participatory democracy. Uh, they tended to focus much more on internal domestic politics. And so the pre previous progressive government of, of No Mu Hyun was very much uh, of the PD faction. He, was, he wasn't he was really interested in foreign policy, not really interested in North Korea. He was really interested in domestic governance and his team was part of that PD faction. Uh, the, the the just previous progressive government, the, the one who, who was just moved on the way out, Moon Jae-in, um, was very much surrounded by people from that national liberation faction. And so their priority was North Korea, North Korea, North Korea. Uh, and um, and as a result, although there had, he did have some you know remarkable successes in foreign policy, the new southern policy, et cetera, it, you know almost every issue went through the prism of North Korea. Um, and the the incoming Yoon government has a much broader international remit, much uh, heavier focus on traditional alliances. Um, and, and as a result, I think you're going to see some some. You know, fundamental shifts in terms of that policy. I think I've already gone on a little bit too long, but let me just add one final comment, uh, and that is an area of hope for me. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at the Korea relationship with with Washington D.C. or you're looking at it from a, uh, an Australian perspective, one of the issues that has really bedeviled the region, you know, for most of modern history, has been long-standing historical tensions between Korea and Japan. Uh, and again, hope springs eternal. There have been many false dawns in this front, but a meeting just this past week between uh, you know mutual friends of both Mike and mine, you know uh, the Japanese Foreign Minister Hayashi Oshimasa uh, and the Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin, and an indication that they want to make that a priority, just gives you a sense of where the priorities of this administration are. Quite different from the previous one. It is less hope for the domestic issues. Uh, and again, if if history follows its course. The weaknesses of a Korean government that on the conservative side of the spectrum are likely to be domestic in nature. Already, you know, again, it was a close election and his approval ratings aren't great, uh, where his successes and his primary acceptance is likely to be in the international arena uh, and foreign policy. And we've already seen that in the first four months. And so that's a good place to stop to give you a, a big picture. Uh, new faces in terms of the, the president, but certainly not new faces in terms of his team. Great. Thank you so much, Gordon. It's been very helpful to uh, give a little bit of more uh, details about uh, President Yoon and also uh, the framing of his 
cabinet, especially for this uh, of the audience here, and judging, like you said, from his early activism and participation in international fora, um, as well as his actually own writing and uh, in uh, Foreign Affairs early February article, that um, he might be inclined to really have more of global uh, outlook, um, given that he has criticized. President Moon for being too North Korea uh, focused. So hopefully um, there will be more of uh, South Korean's activism in the Indo-Pacific sphere, which we will dive in a little bit more in the Q&A session um, later on. But I wanted to move on to Philippines now that had an election early in May. And um, Charmaine, uh, many people observe the election uh, with a lot of surprise and awe, even if, given the results of the election and the nature uh, of the campaign and the return of the Marcus family to power. Um, and also Asian and the pairing of, of uh, Marcus Jr. and, and Sarah Duterte, that was also quite um, an extraordinary for external uh, watchers. And um, even for those who were more supportive of um, the, uh, the Former, prior, uh, former minister from um, Deputy, uh, Vice Min President, sorry, Lenny Robredo, right? Uh, what, what conclusion did you draw from this very exceptional election, um, given President Marcos' background and dynastic polit uh, politics legacy? And given that the Philippines, uh, perhaps among all of allies that we are discussing, is probably the most interesting sphere in terms of alliance relations with the United States. It, it's gone uh, during the Duterte times quite a little bit further away or openly criticizing uh, or even questioning the premise uh, of the alliance. Uh, I think everybody's anticipating to see what Marcus Jr.'s presidency will bring, uh, particularly in relations to the um, US and alliance um, uh, uh, foundations. And yeah, we're keen to hear your assessments um, uh, of uh, uh, Pre uh, President Marcos Jr. given that not much of his campaign was actually focused on the foreign policy. So Charmaine, maybe ask you to take voice. Thank you, Hong, for, for organizing this, this discussion. And good morning to everybody. I'm joining you today from a rather rainy Manila, and it's it's an honor to be with such distinguished speakers in, in the panel. Now, I'm here to talk about Philippine politics and the aftermath of the recent national elections. We can expect some aspects of the Duterte administration's foreign policy to continue in the new Marcos administration. At the same time, however, we can expect a lot of changes. There are rich domestic dynamics at play here. And depending on which hand is played, we can expect the Marcos administration's trajectory to follow the footsteps of Duterte or we can also expect that there will be new directions for the country. Let me begin then um, with, uh, with the China issue. Marcos met with a Chinese ambassador in the Philippines shortly after announcing his candidacy in October 2021. And then when he was presumptive president, he had a lengthy phone conversation with President Xi Jinping, where they discussed shifting the bilateral relationship to a higher gear. President Xi's preference to speak again in private is indicative of the likelihood of talks continuing at the bilateral level rather than at the multilateral level. It's worth re-emphasizing that the Philippines needs to engage at the multilateral level to leverage the 2016 arbitration award in the South China Sea. The Marcos administration, after all, remains committed to pursuing an independent foreign policy. So it is very critical that we continue to engage at the multilateral level. It is also worth mentioning that about two weeks ago, shortly before we celebrated the sixth anniversary of the arbitral ruling, the Chinese foreign minister came to the Philippines for an official visit. The visit's emphasis on neighborhood diplomacy, infrastructure, and vaccines reflects China's desire to make the bilateral relationship seem more than just about the South China Sea. 
which is very similar to how the United States managed to recalibrate its relations with the Philippines as being more than just the alliance. Despite these overtures from China, Marcus said that the Philippines' sovereignty is sacred. A welcome move indeed to international observers of the South China Sea and supporters of the rules-based international order. But the question is how to leverage the 2016 award. And this is something that's still pretty much a wait and see for, for a lot of Filipinos. There are also both continuity and change um, in the Philippines' relations with the United States. The U.S.-Philippine relationship under Duterte was interesting, to say the least. Um, he, he, he has always had a very strong anti-U.S. position, even when he was still mayor of, of Davao. During his presidency, one might recall the dramatic policy shifts from, on one hand, wanting to abrogate the Visiting Forces Agreement in early 2020 after his chief of police's U.S. visa was canceled to suspending the abrogation at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic to finally canceling the abrogation after U.S. Secretary of Defense Austin's visit to Manila in mid-2021. So in essence, after all the, you know, uh, after all these movements in foreign policy, it's business as usual in the alliance. This oscillating foreign policy is often an apt description of the Philippines' international relations. But we can expect something different from the Marcos presidency because he does not have as intense of an anti-U.S. sentiment as Duterte. If anything, it's certain that the entire presidency will be about restoring the name and image of the Marcos family. This was, after all, the, uh, the, the foundation of his successful campaign. During the campaign, the narrative that has taken root is that Marcos, the father's rule in the 1960s and the 1970s were the glory days or the golden age of the Philippines. This despite the massive human rights violations during martial law. Within this premise, it is then up to Marcos to continue what his father started. His campaign slogan, Babangon Muli, which literally means to rise up or to get back up on one's feet, now means rising from the decay that the country suffered when it was not under the family. In this sense, the vast information ecosystem on which the campaign depended really was in view of the goal of restoration. Underpinning that is the Marcos family's need to be recognized in their rightful place in the Philippines and in the world. Now, one final point before I end, President Marcos's first State of the Nation address is going to be on Monday, July 25th. Um, I can only gauge what he's going to say based on his inauguration speech last month. And perhaps this is going to be more aspirational than, than anything else. Then during his inauguration, he gave very broad strokes and very gen general and generic statements. It was the same call for unity that propelled him into office, but no details whatsoever on implementation. No clear plans for pandemic recovery, nothing set in, in stone um, on the economic plan, except for just um, a repetitive call for unity. Let's all unite and we can go through at anything and everything the world throws at it throws at us. This ambiguity is consistent with the campaign, but ambiguity also runs the risk of non-transparency in governance. In the same inauguration speech, he touched on Ukraine, repricing the narrative that the Philippines is blameless and wants to be friends with all. This implies neutrality and will have deep and long-range impacts. I also expect that there will be a lot of nostalgia from his father's rule, which likely means that the narrative of the golden age will continue to be his springboard. Finally, I hope he can deliver his speech in Filipino rather than in English, like his inauguration speech, so that he can connect with the 31 million Filipinos who voted for him. Thanks so much. Let me end here. And I hope this is sufficient food for thought to fuel our discussions today.
Certainly. Thank you, Charmaine. Very fascinating and, and I'm sure we're keen to watch. The alliance system, uh, of course, have outlasted many power transitions and domestic politics. But uh, one of the reasons why this webinar came to uh, realization uh, is also the, uh, the fact that um, domestic politics have significant imprints on alliances and, and no better examples than uh, President Duterte of the Philippines previously, as well as President Donald Trump. So it's important for us to understand those domestic uh, dynamics as well. Uh, moving on to Australia, who had also election in May, Ian, um, foreign policy rarely really have deciding factor in, in the elections, right? But this time around, um, the China factor certainly made an, uh, a, a big impact, um, even, you know, having uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a different, very divisive effect while uh, you know the campaigning was accusing uh, Labour of being you know Xi Jinping's vote and on those kind of poster circulating, um, so certainly there there is the security and external security factor uh, have been and foreign policy in in this election. Um, so far, as judging from the new government, uh, Albanese government, and very active um, participation in uh, Quad, NATO, but also a, 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 a Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles going to DC last week and giving very um, clear speeches about commitment of Australia to the alliance. Um, and judging from all of that, there is not much of difference between um, this government and the previous government in the way they, they look at alliance. Um, is that what uh, also you take uh, from the, this government so far? If there's any changes, uh, I wonder what, what uh, do you spot as uh, the most primary ones? Um, and given that you've had uh, research alliances from the more historical perspective be really uh, you know, beneficial for our um, discussion to, to hear your expectations from this government uh, towards uh, its relations with the US. Yeah. Thanks, Wong, uh, for the introduction and for the framing questions. Um, firstly, I, I, when we look back on the election campaign uh, in Australia, I think it was one of the notable features of it is that because there is now a, a fairly increased focus on Taiwan, it's actually becoming more difficult to disentangle what might have been previously discrete Australian discussions about ANZUS from the broader Australian discussions about the, the relationship between Canberra and Beijing. And we almost get this kind of corollary now where enthusiasm for the alliance sort of equates or, or correlates with uh, hostility towards China or more general hawkishness and vice versa. And so though ANZUS itself wasn't discussed much in the election campaign, the way that China was discussed and invoked was actually quite unprecedented and, and hopefully won't be repeated in, in future campaigns. Uh, you know, in the lead up to the May election, we saw this loose talk of preparing for war, of accusations that the ALP would appease China that Beijing wanted the ALP to win, and finally, quite lurid and, and outrageous accusations that Richard Miles was a, a Manchurian candidate when you might have described him as one of the more hawkish Labor figures. So the real downside of this is uh, I think that we're likely to see a continuation of these kinds of fairly cheap political attacks, um, and that if there was any minor improvement in the Australia-China relationship, it wouldn't surprise me if this prompted questions along the lines of, well, what did the ALP government give up to secure this concession from Beijing? And it could also prompt and revive an, a line of political attack that has been used occasionally in the past, which is that the ALP is not uh, capable of, uh, of managing the alliance relationship with the United States well. Now, in making those observations, I'm not saying that we should have broad, unquestioning bipartisanship on the alliance or on Australia's relations with China. Neither of those would be in our national interest. But using these fact, or these uh, these discussions and debates uh, as a domestic political wedge uh, is a bit worrying because it could politicise the alliance in particular uh, in a fairly non-substantive and unhelpful way. Because of these factors and because the coalition, at least in the last few years, has run this line of attack, I actually think that sustaining a new approach towards China is going to be difficult for the ALP. It will require a fair degree of political courage, 
to take on the coalition in what's perceived to be their one of their strong areas of national security and foreign policy. The Albanese government's going to have to be prepared to calmly and persuasively present any new policies or positions and defend them against what could be uh, fairly shrill attacks from the coalition opposition. And only time is going to tell whether they actually are up for the challenge that this might pose. So if they are the, the sort of the observations from their campaign, many people have said and noted, although we've had a very busy couple of months since the election, um, the ALP is essentially at its core running the same kind of policy positions as the previous coalition government. There are a few differences, though. The first difference that I would make is that the ALP is taking the relationship with China seriously. And to contextualise that, what I mean is that the previous government knew that due to where the relationship had wound up, due to things that China had done and due to things that Canberra had done as well, there was going to be no improvement while Scott Morrison and the coalition were in power. And so I think they came to see China as something that mainly could be invoked to achieve domestic political advantage. And they didn't actually have to worry about the China relationship because they knew it was in the deep freeze and would remain in there um, so long as they were in power. They didn't have to think about China towards the end. But now, because there is some possibility of improvement under the new Labor government, we're seeing a new attitude. And whereas the previous government almost operated as if annoying Beijing meant that you had good Australian foreign policy, the current Labor government, I think, isn't afraid at all to take a position that will displease Beijing, but it doesn't do so gratuitously and it doesn't appear to be making a song and dance about it when it does. And I do think that's a fairly important difference from the last government and, and uh, the government under Turnbull, where they would say things like the Australian people have stood up in Mandarin. They are the differences, but it isn't clear to me yet as to whether the ALP actually has a fully formed and stress-tested plan for how they're going to approach our relationships with both China and the United States. Particularly, it's interesting uh, on the China aspect in their effort to come up with a, a framing concept. I mean, the, the pr previous coalition government eventually settled on a balance of power that favours freedom, whereas we hear under the ALP talk of a strategic equilibrium or a settling point between the United States and China. But these haven't really been fleshed out in any way that gives us a firm idea as to what they are, and importantly, as to how they will guide um, ALP decision makers as they are considering how to manage relations with China. One important difference that may come under greater scrutiny in uh, the next few years is that there are differences in how the previous government talked about Taiwan compared to the current government. Uh, as most of us will know, the, the previous government strongly hinted, but never explicitly confirmed that Australia would assist the United States to defend Taiwan from any attempted Chinese invasion. Now, the current government has not echoed these sentiments, but have instead, in previous comments when ministers have spoken about it, emphasised that another Taiwan Strait crisis would pose immense risks of escalation and destruction. Now, so far, the ALP government has actually hewed to the previously long-standing bipartisan position that government ministers did not speculate about hypothetical crises over Taiwan. Um, and we're going to have to wait and see whether that, that uh, pattern continues. Um, but what I do think we can start to see a little bit of an emerging difference is that the previous government focused on supporting US efforts to deter Chinese military action. But I suspect that the figures involved and the, you know, the ministers and the leaders in the present government will be a little bit more willing to consider how that kind of policy would actually be perceived in Beijing as very anti-status quo and thus may actually be counterproductive if the goal is to avoid escalation and to maintain the current situation. I think that's my time up. Thank you, Ian. And that's very helpful. Um, I think... The, um, the both of you and you and Charmaine mentioned the China factor um, uh, in in the evolving relationship with the US and um, alliance, but also 
um, in the in domestic politics. So um, a question I would like to pose for uh, your um, uh, consideration later in Q&A and perhaps uh, also um, invite our audience to think about that frame as well is, um, what is the rise of security challenges from China means more commitment to the alliance with the US. Is it equal? Is it the, the only premise we should be looking at? And um, yeah, would that be something that automatically means more, the more challenges uh, coming from China, the more commitment with the US alliances or not? And as our, the name of our institute, the US Asia Center suggests, we are here for dialogue, uh, connection and understanding. That's why um, I want to forge this two-way conversation rather one way. And I invited Mike to speak um, about the US uh, perspective, give, give us a little bit more of, uh, understanding what is the Biden administration expecting from the new government in, in its allies countries. Um, the new, um, if there are any uh, concerns, what are the um, uh, approaches that are significantly in distinguished al already from the Trump administration is the emphasis on alliances, but is Biden succeeding so far in the, the, this approach, especially when we, we talk about Asian allies, because there are significant um, progress, I would say, with the European and NATO allies, given the context of Ukraine-Russia war. But uh, is Biden um, succeeding as much in Asia as well? Mike, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Wong. Thanks, for, Gordon, for inviting me. And, and, and thanks, Ian and Charmaine, for really interesting comments. Um, I can speak about the US perspective because I'm in Washington. Um, I'm already head of the US Study Center. I'm home packing. As you can say, for, as you can see from the shelf full of books, I'm doing a really bad job packing. So I'll get to it as soon as we're done again. Um, so uh, leaders matter. I'm glad you're talking about leaders. I saw that up close and personal when I worked in the White House for four and a half years. I was in the room for President Bush's summits with, you know, everyone from Hu Jintao to John um, uh, Key and others. And um, really a good summit or a bad summit could be decisive in um, in, in the trajectory of bilateral and, and regional relations. So it really matters. Allies matter. Um, the um, the 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 Biden uh, White House Indo-Pacific strategy mentions uh, allies and partners more than anything. Um, uh, allies are cool. Uh, Center for American Progress polling shows that young Americans, millennials, think allies are great. Highest support in a lot of Asian countries. Support for the alliance with the U.S. Uh, the demographics, you know, show that support starts to go down as people are younger. But in the U.S., younger Americans think alliances are great. They're very they're popular. They're cool. I've been waiting my whole career for this. And finally, my theme, alliances are cool. And I'm getting a little old for it, but it's good to see it last. Um, the Biden administration, um, you know, uh, is building its strategy around allies. Um, uh, it wasn't always so. I, I went to work in the Pentagon in the mid 90s for Kurt Campbell because after the Cold War, our alliances were adrift. We didn't know what they were for. And, and, and Kurt and Joe Nye and Others brought me in to, to think about our alliances in Asia and rebuild them. Um, we drifted again in 2012-13. Uh, polls in the US in those years, 10 years ago, showed that more Americans wanted to work with China than with our allies, with Japan, Australia, Korea. But now polls show overwhelmingly more than two thirds of Americans in most polls think we should be working with our allies to deal with China, not working with China as our priority. So the overall framework for alliances is in a good place Politically in the U.S., there's bipartisan support in the Congress more than ever uh, in this town. Um, uh, but the reality is we need allies more. The distribution of power, the challenges we face, the um, growing coercive pressure from China uh, around the Indo-Pacific means we are much more dependent on allies. One former uh, Indo-PACOM commander used to say we've gone from interoperability to interdependence with our allies. We, we, we need them much more than we ever have. Um, and so these leadership changes you all are talking about really matter. And to quickly go through how I think official Washington, the blob, uh, uh, thinks about uh, each of these uh, leaderships. Let me do a quick um, round the neighborhood. Beginning with Japan, Japan um, is the linchpin of the American alliance system. Um, the first US Navy ship 
in the Pacific in 1815, USS Essex uh, came, the captain came back and reported that someday we'll have a relationship with Japan. Um, George F. Cannon in designing the post-war architecture, as Ian would know, um, saw Japan and the first island chain as indispensable. Cannon called Japan the workshop of Asia. We could not lose Japan. We had to have Japan. And so the leadership changes in Japan have been absolutely critical to American strategy, more so now than ever. We've had some lemons. We've had some leaders who threw Washington for a loss, uh, most notably um, Prime Minister Hatoyama, who uh, President Obama famously called loopy. Um, but uh, for the past um, a decade, and particularly under Abe Shinzo, we've had a very steady, very strong hand in Japan. Um, Kishida continues that. The upper house selection victory of the ruling party continues that. There's not a lot of alarm about Japan and Washington. And I'd say Japan has more influence on U.S. strategy right now than just about any country in the world. You sometimes hear rumblings about whether Abe's momentum has slowed, whether Japan can stay focused on Abe's strategy, but no worry about divergence from that strategy. I thought Ian described the Australian political scene almost exactly the way people in Washington who follow the Australia Alliance are thinking about it. Very uh, pleased with the continuity, um, very pleased that the uh, the new Labor government is um, uh, absolutely committed to the alliance. Um, people remember when Mark Latham, a Labor candidate, ran against the alliance in 2004. We're, we're way far away from those days. Very reassuring. Some of the early moves by the new government, particularly on climate, and towards Southeast Asia have been very well received. But Ian, you know, raised the questions that you sometimes hear in Washington. Um, what exactly does this framing of the US-China-Australia relationship mean in practice, for example? Ian expressed that uh, concern almost the way I've heard it from some people in DC while I'm here. Um, questions not about the commitment to AUKUS. It's very clear this government is committed to AUKUS, but will they pay for it? So people are asking, what will the defense budget look like? Will labor um, to deal with a tougher fiscal situation, um, possible recession and other priorities, um, put the money behind this project that it needs? So there are some kind of tactical questions, but in general, um, you know, we would be lucky if all our allies had democratic transitions like Australia just had. We'd be in a very good place, but we're not so lucky. Uh, except in Korea, where we were very lucky, uh, at least from a U.S. perspective, as, as Gordon suggested. The official Washington was neutral on the election. When Mr. Yoon got elected president, there was a massive sigh of relief that you could hear all along the Potomac River, a, a bipartisan sigh of relief. Um, the Moon government was becoming very, very difficult for even a, a Democratic administration in Washington to work with, with their um, increasingly myopic preoccupation on a peace mechanism with North Korea and their, you know, insistence on strategic ambiguity, on just avoiding, um, you know, basically a, a sort of ASEAN way of approaching the China problem. But in Northeast Asia, coming from an ally with whom we have a joint and combined command. Um, and so people were, didn't want to show any official uh, unease or discomfort, but we're, we're greatly relieved at the election of Mr. Yoon. What Korea now brings to the table is stuff Korea has done all along in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, infrastructure financing, development assistance through COICA, um, capacity building with provision of patrol boats to Vietnam, supplies to the Philippines, everything the US, Japan, and Australia do, but by themselves, unilaterally, not part of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So there's a real opportunity uh, to bring Korea in. I think the election in Korea was the biggest strategic setback for China in the Indo-Pacific of the last few years. Uh, it, it, you know, the Korean Peninsula is not called the cockpit of Asia for nothing. It's where the great powers decide their differences historically. And the choices Koreans make matter. And um, so that is encouraging. The, the challenges are, as Gordon pointed out, um, that Korea remains quite polarized and Mr. Yun's support is low and that worries people in Washington. Um, and the Biden administration would really like to get the Japan-Korea problem fixed. And all I can tell him is Gordon Flake tried 25 times and could never fix it. And if Gordon Flake can't fix it, and Victor Cha and I can't fix it, I don't know who can. There is some positive momentum, but the bottom line is 
the Japanese side, in my view, is too pessimistic about Yun. They're worried that, you know, he won't keep promises he makes. It's sort of now in the Japanese narrative in Tokyo that the Koreans won't keep their promises. Even someone as favorably disposed to Japan and, and the U.S. alliance as Mr. Yun. So the Japanese are too pessimistic. My sense is that our good friends in Seoul are too optimistic about Japan, uh, too optimistic that the election of a conservative leader and the departure of uh, Mr. Moon will make it really easy for Tokyo to make compromises and find a, a grand solution to the Japan career problem. So too pessimistic in Tokyo, too optimistic in Seoul, um, not likely to listen to the U.S. Australia has some agency on this. Australia has, as Gordon knows well, a quite strong relationship with Korea now and with Japan, of course. Um, so those two factors, domestic politics and um, and 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 the Japan problem will limit how far uh, the UN government aligns with the US, but not a lot. The basic views of China and Korea don't vary all that much from Japan or Australia. It's just that Korea lives a lot closer and has to be you know, more careful. On the Philippines, I just conclude by saying um, uh, very historic ties. You know, the architects of American strategy before 1898 had no interest in the Philippines at all. You know, Alfred Thayer Mahan, Commodore Perry, they, they wanted they wanted Formosa or the Ryukyus or the Bonin Islands as America's Hong Kong in the Pacific. Um, but we ended up in the Philippines and have, you know, for well over 100 years forged a partnership in blood and, and sweat and, and mutual love and mutual frustration, as Charmaine would know well. Uh, the ultimate love-hate relationship. In public opinion polls in the Philippines, um, usually the Philippines are in the top three countries in the world in thinking that American leadership in the world matters. And yet, as you saw with Mr. Duterte, you know, often the most frustrated with the U.S. The, the Philippines matter a lot more now because the Taiwan contingencies we've been talking about are no longer just Taiwan Strait contingencies. They're first island chain contingencies. There is no way the Philippines, in my view, can stay out of it. Neutrality is not an option. If the Philippines were neutral, but but not porous, able to secure their, their, their territories, it would be okay. And the problem the US has is the Philippines are very porous. It's too easy for PLA subs to get through. It's too easy, frankly, for Chinese influence in, to penetrate Manila. And I think the administration is very focused on the Philippines. Uh, CNAS just did a very good report. Uh, I was part of the task force on how to think about the new Philippine government. Official Washington, the White House, the State Department really want to get the relationship with the Philippines right. It matters more than it did 10 years ago. It matters more than it did 20 years ago. Um, I, I see some encouraging signs with the new Marcos government. Um, the defense uh, secretary is being kept on in a new role. There's some familiar faces. There's some continuity, as Charmaine said. You know, President Marcos doesn't have the same visceral sort of anti-American emotions as Duterte did. So some promise there, but as the history of U.S.-Philippines relations um, demonstrates, it's not going to be linear or easy. Um, but I, I would just conclude by saying the U.S. Uh, government, Washington, is very focused on getting this relationship right. I think they'll really try hard to work with Mr. Marcos. Very last thing I'd say is, as we talk about all of these variables and all of these leaders, the variable that probably matters most is Xi Jinping. I, I, I am personally skeptical that she is going to give the labor government or Mr. Marcos, let alone Kishida, very much latitude or flexibility. I don't think it's in Xi Jinping's playbook to be subtle or to use carrots. This is a guy who likes sticks. So I'm perhaps more skeptical than some of the other panelists that there will be an opening in relations with China. but but we'll see. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm sure we'll get to China and Xi Jinping in the discussion as well. Um, I think, uh, like you pointed out, alliance is very important for the U.S. grant strategy, not only because uh, it recognizes that, you know, alone it cannot have the same uh, preponderance as it used to have, but also this is alliances and partnership is what the U.S. has as a strategic advantage in the great power competitions with, with China, so it needs to use it wisely. Um, we have now around um, half an hour time for the interactive part of the webinar, so I invite all our um, audience to submit their questions via chat. Um, and while he, uh, the questions are coming in, let me start um, with a, a question to, to the panelists um, before we're going into um, individual countries. 
is a question about AUKUS, a new framework like AUKUS, uh, potentially emerging more. Um, AUKUS is in between um, Australia, US and UK. Uh, and many say that it's not an alliance, it's not an informal, even some um, downgraded to a purely a defence procurement uh, arrangement only. But it is, of course, based on long-term strategic trust that is built and comfort and a, a level of interoperability that is built thanks to Alliance. So my question to um, Ian and Mike is how this kind of framework alter the bilateral um, relations, the, the Alliance um, relations, is that helpful in making it broader, bigger, you know, in the trilateral or more framework? And the question to Gordon and Charmaine is, what do you see um, in, in, in this kind of framework? Do you, um, do countries like Philippines and um, South Korea wanting something similar? Do they feel uh, left out uh, of uh, AUKUS? Um, and are, you, are they pursuing a similar kind of arrangements going forward in, in, in this, hopefully in this administration? So I'll start with this um, and then we'll, we'll move on to individual countries' question as also our audience uh, submit uh, more questions as we go. Uh, so Ian and Mike, would you would you like to start on how you see um, arrangement like AUKUS uh, help or alter the existing um, framework of alliances that have been for seven decades already? How do you, Ian? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, Huang, I think you put it really well when you said that it, it, it's not part of the alliance, but it was perhaps facilitated by the the, um, the very strong degree of trust that's built up over many decades. Um, look, I, I think it could be quite useful in ensuring that Australia uh, obtains a very unique capability by many navies around the world. Um, but there are immense challenges associated with this. I've not met too many people in Canberra who are, who are willing to take me up on a bet that we'll get a sub by 2040 that'll be powered by a nuclear reactor. And I know of many people, in, including some a uh, handful of the former government people who are very sceptical about Australia's ability to de deliver on this over the long term. Um, so it was a great announceable and a great press conference, but it's going to take a lot of effort uh, to sustain over the next two decades in particular. Um, also, I, I guess from my sort of... Uh, um, alliance theorist perspective, I was a little bit concerned by the degree to which uh, some people sort of view it as, as the answer to all of our problems, um, almost kind of this attitude of, of, well, we'll just get the Americans and the British to, to home port nuclear submarines out of HMS Sterling in the West. And that, you know, like, we won't need to worry about things anymore. That'll or almost this implicit assumption that that would solve so many of our problems. Um, I don't think that's accurate. And I think reports in recent days have shown that uh, you know, we're not going to get subs that are coming off the US production line. This is going to be something that's going to take a very long time. And so I think the 2040s timeline is becoming more and more, um, more, more accepted by more people. The, the other concern I have very quickly is that the degree to which it was depicted as something that, um, well, this was it. Australia's made its, its long-term choices for the next decades. And, it, you know, the language that was used out of Washington was that AUKUS binds decisively Australia to US policy. And we had uh, one former US official say that, well, this is it. Australia won't have a choice anymore. Australia will have to fight alongside the US in, in a future conflict. Um, all those things are really big claims. Um, and this does not deprive the current or future Australian governments of agency. And they will have the opportunity to make decisions in future, but they may incur greater penalties for doing so given how AUKUS increases Australia's reliance on the United States for this kind of technology. Um, so, it, it, as, as the audience would know, the US alliance system in Asia uh, was uh, created as a series of bilateral alliances, um, uh, primarily because um, Washington was afraid of a collective security arrangement like NATO that would allow um, leaders in Taipei or Seoul to drag us into a war to reunify their countries. And we didn't want to fight a war with China and Russia again after the Korean War, if we could help it. Whereas NATO collective security, of course, was the framework from the beginning. We're now in a period where because of the rising challenges from China uh, in particular, 
there's an appetite for a collective security arrangement like NATO in the Pacific, but it's not going to happen for a whole bunch of reasons people know well. The nature of economic relations with China, um, the, the variation of threat perceptions and interests among the, the parties. And so what we've seen over the last 20, 25 years is a growth of these minilateral uh, arrangements. And uh, they include AUKUS and the Quad, but they also include uh, the US, Japan, Australia trilateral security relationship, which is in some ways the most substantial of all of these. Uh, and when we're um, when we're able to do it, the US, Japan, Korea trilateral uh, security cooperation, TCOG on diplomacy. So uh, what I'm saying is the, the, the future of the architecture of these security partnerships is going to be still basically the operating framework of the Cold War with bilateral alliances, but more and more of, of these minilaterals around them. And AUKUS is one of them. Um, it's, I mean, Ian's right, it's not the be all and end all and solution for all of Australian strategic problems. Thanks very much, the checks in the mail. Um, it's complicated. I'm more of optimistic than Ian, um, which we can get into if you want, but it is complicated, but it's not also the only vessel for Australian security uh, and strategic thinking. It's, 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 it's part of a diversified playbook for Canberra. Um, and where I see real value in this networking, whether it's AUKUS or the Quad or the trilateral security relationship among the US, Japan, Australia, is first, it signals to Beijing there are geopolitical consequences for coercing neighbors. These things always grow after China bullies somebody. And so, you know, Beijing does not want uh, a collective security arrangement in Asia to contain them. And although Xi Jinping is not getting the message the way we'd like, these do send the signal, and I think usefully, there are consequences for coercion. Um, the second thing it does is it creates, although it's not a collective security arrangement, it creates a network of interoperability. At CSIS, we did a report we called Federated Defense looking at this, where these different arrangements create levels of interoperability, tech transfer, transfer of the most sensitive technologies like nuclear that make it easier for us to operate together if we have to. And that may prove handy someday. And at a minimum, it reinforces the signal there are costs to coercion. Um, but you can't drive it faster than it will go. And I think um, you know we're right to be cautious about expecting, as Ian says, that AUKUS or any other arrangement is going to solve all our problems. Thank you, um, Charmaine and Gordon. While you, um, well, uh, another question came from Kate O'Shaughnessy that I would like to bind together with with this question is consideration about Quad as well. What what does Philippines and Korea think about Quad and how their government um, view uh, the Quad? So if you could bind that with um, answering the AUKUS question as well. Thank you. Yeah. Charmaine, you want to go first? I'll follow sure. up. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for this, uh, Huang. I was actually planning on, uh, on addressing um, Kate O'Shaughnessy's uh, question as well. You asked about whether or not the Philippines feels a little bit left out from, from AUKUS. My, my take is that it doesn't really feel <laughs> left out, uh, primarily because of the existing alliance with the United States. In fact, for the longest time, Filipinos have rested on the security guarantees of the alliance, and this allowed it to focus on domestic insurgencies rather than on external security. Hence, for as long as the alliance remains, arrangements like AUKUS and the Quad kind of just you know, go over our head. Of course, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to leverage these minilateral arrangements. In fact, this is what I hope to see in the new Marcos administration in its pursuit of an independent foreign policy to connect with the spokes instead of just with a, with a hub. Well, that's uh, thank you, Charmaine. That's a wonderful uh, segue into what I was going to say. I, I'm here in Melbourne for a, a, a conference at the Menzies Institute yesterday, where I had a chance to kind of speak on the the, the transition uh, that we've seen or the transformation we've seen of kind of U.S. alliances in this region uh, from 1950 to today. And and my principal theme was precisely that. Right, what started out as kind of hubs and spokes has seen much more dramatic development in relationships between the spokes, you know, a much more robust ecosystem. Uh, and, and obviously for the last decade, that's been driven by concern about rising China. Uh, but in the last five, six years, it's been driven by anxiety about the United States and its, its trustworthiness. And so what you've seen is, is a lot of intra-regional um, um, cooperation, 
Uh, and you've seen co countries like Australia welcome uh, Japan to have a very proactive role, urging Korea to take a more proactive role, welcoming the Brits and the French and the Europeans and the Germans into this region, wanting Indonesia and others to kind of step up and play more of a role just because of our shared anxiety. Um, I, I, um, I was fortunate to have been in Washington, D.C. the same week in September that we had the Osman ministerial meetings, a quad leaders meeting, uh, and then the announcement of AUKUS. Um, and I would note for our viewers, uh, Jen Jacket did a wonderful report on the implications of AUKUS, AUKUS on the technological side for the United States Study Center. So just go to the ussc.edu kind of website. You'll find a great report there. I actually tend to think that if it weren't for the politics around the announcement being a summit there in Washington, the need both of the government here in Canberra at the time and, and particularly the government in the UK to kind of have a big deliverable and for the inclusion of the submarines, AUKUS would not even got made the news, right? It, AUKUS, I view, is much more of a natural evolution of an already deeply integrated relationship between the United States and Australia, uh, where I actually think the, the, the Five Eyes relationship is, is far more important in the broader sweep of history than the ANZUS Treaty itself. We, we, we've focused a lot in the last year on celebrating an, uh, anniversaries of ANZUS, uh, but the ANZUS is a one-page treaty, and what we've really seen is, is a broader evolution over 70 years where uh, in terms of trust, in terms of intelligence sharing, in terms of intelligence analysis, in terms of cooperation, Australia and the United States are closer together than ever before. Uh, and that includes political relations, but it's not dependent on political relations. It's a remarkable development. So in that regard, AUKUS you know, is not an alliance, it's a technology you know, sharing, industrial kind of cooperation agreement, which is a natural outgrowth of where we were going already. And it was just the French element, the submarine elements that kind of caused it to be big and sexy with a little bit of politics put in there. Uh, if you look at it, to answer your question, Huang, from the region's perspective, um, you know, Korea actually has been pretty vocal over the last several decades about wanting nuclear propulsion technology. And the American response was always, we share that technology with no one. And to find out in the last nine months that not only had the U.S. shared it with the U.K., but now they're sharing with Australia, did raise some eyebrows and soul. Uh, and I think it will be an issue of ongoing conversation. Uh, on a more positive note, however, I would note that uh, Korea, Japan, other allies in the region look at AUKUS as exactly a model. They want some of that, right? We had a mutual friend of Mike and mine after he's spoken to Mike the week before, speak to us a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of months ago, Taro Kono, or Kono Taro, the former foreign minister, defense minister, he, he liked the term jockus, right? He wanted Japan in there. Japan from day one has made it clear that they're interested in being closer. And there is some discussion about AUKUS uh, being kind of a template for working with other treaty allies in the region in terms of strengthening interoperability, which is a good chunk of what this integrated deterrence that the Biden administration is talking about is. So in that regard, I think it, it's probably a good thing. Uh, let me just kind of throw it, add the question of the quad that, that, that uh, uh, Kate raised um, and, and say in a broader level for Australia, both the quad and AUKUS have been really good for our regional relationships because it has led to, you know, Japan was already there. Uh, to be honest, but it's also led countries like Korea or Indonesia or Vietnam or India to kind of see Australia in a new light. Uh, and it, it really has enhanced our relative importance in the eyes of other key partners in the region. Uh, and so what we have seen is since September of last year, I would say a hypercharging of Australia's regional diplomatic and security outreach and outreach to us from the region. And, and those are directly results of the quad. And so I, I don't think there, you know, is, is any, I mean, there was early discussion that the Indonesians and the Malaysians were concerned about AUKUS, you know, out of, after some initial uh, misinformation about there being nuclear weapons in the submarines. But I think that was a public pronouncement. The official and reaction has been almost universally positive uh, and it's been a great boon for Australia's role in the region. So. Thank you. Um, to your statement, with, with that, uh, where you added up, Gordon, uh, about Australia's hyperactivity in, in, the, in the region, 
Uh, Ian, if I could put a question to you, Richard Rawls was last week in, in uh, DC and gave a, a big speech at CSIS and not only talking about interoperability, but also interchangeability with US forces, that's something that Mike also mentioned. Um, so the question is, you know, does that bind Australia more with the US, despite at the same time all those additional networks, a diplomatic network at least, but in terms of defense, it is ultimately bringing Australia even closer um, and, and more intertwined with the US. Um, and in fact, uh, um, Marl's speech was marked in the Chinese media as, you know, saying the same language as this Dutton, so no change over there uh, too much. And, and there is some uh, same sense of securitization and the need for more defense spending and investment, um, despite the diplomatic gestures of, of dialogue. Um, so I, I wanted to ask your opinion um, about the direction of defense policy of, the, uh, of Australia. And if I could bind it with one of the questions that our audience a member asked, um, does Australia or uh, do Australians know enough about China and Chinese and their norms um, and engagement? So two, two actually different questions, but uh, they all relate to, to China in one way or another. Yeah, um, the interoperability one we could talk about for great for quite some length. Um, the, I, I think it is almost um, fetishized a little bit these days. Interoperability is great, um, but you know the the free nations of the world defeated the Nazis despite the fact that everybody used a different caliber rifle round. Um, interoperability does help when you are fighting a war, but you can fight wars without interoperability. Um, the Perhaps dark side of it that's that's often not examined, particularly in Australia, is the degree to which um, reliance on a single supplier for particularly for high end technologies, um, you become dependent on software updates and source codes and all these kinds of things, uh, and you give uh, the the nation who's supplying these things more points of leverage where they can say, well, we're not going to provide you with the latest software update. Uh, if you don't support our policy on a particular thing. Now, we've not had too many instances of, that we know of, at least, of that happening within the US-Australia relationship. But if there are situations in the future where we think our interests might diverge, we can identify and try and think about and perhaps mitigate in advance some of the more likely pressure points or, or new introduced risks that that kind of reliance um, brings into our defence posture and our strategic posture. On China... Um, I, I'm not a, a China scholar and we have far too few of them in Australia, which says something about that, that the answer to that question. Um, but to my mind, what we're missing more than knowledge of Australia, uh, sorry, knowledge of China in Australia at the moment is a willingness to think about what the world looks like from Beijing's perspective. Um, there seems to be this idea that, uh, you know, I'll be the first to say that China has a repressive, authoritarian, illiberal political system that I would not want to live under. Um, and you can stop your analysis there or you can say, well, okay, how does it view the world? What does it see when it looks out? Is it afraid? Is it scared? Does it feel powerful? All these kinds of things. And I think a lot of the time, um, the questions and the discussion about China in Australia don't go as far as they should. Um, and you can do that simply by being curious and open rather than being a China expert, I think. Um, and if we can stay with the China topic, because um, as Mike pointed out, there is a variable of, of Xi Jinping and um, China's active diplomacy towards all those new governments in place. And Charmaine, can I start with you? Because this is quite interesting for um, for the regional, especially in Southeast Asia, when it comes to the South China Sea. And you mentioned uh, the very critical factor of you know how Marcus Junius um, administration will go about the arbitrage tribunal ruling and whatnot. So at the tail end of Duterte's uh, uh, presidency, very uh, be, just few days before actually Mark was taking over, um, Duterte allegedly uh, uh, stopped the uh, discussion about joint exploration agreement. Uh, we're not talking about also uh, stopping uh, the infrastructure uh, uh, agreements and whatnot. Uh, uh, what do you think in terms of how, what Marcus will position himself in uh, in the pivot towards Beijing? Because on one hand, there is that need for investments and economic um, 
advantage coming, or at least pledges of advantages coming from the relationship with China, which will be very needed in the Philippines post-COVID time, especially in the time of, of economic crisis and inflation and food scarcity and whatnot. Um, but he'll, he'll need to walk a very thin line. Um, to uh, also stay true to what he mentioned of sacred sovereignty of the Philippines. So, um, uh, there, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, there also have been an outreach from Beijing uh, towards the new administration. Uh, so what is your realistic expectation from the Marcus Jr., how he will handle the Beijing pressure? Certainly, uh, former President Duterte doesn't seem to make it easy for the new administration uh, with, with all these um, decisions uh, prior to him, him stepping down, which is precisely why I, I, I think domestic issues will continue to be front and center of the Marcus administration, um, particularly in, in the economic sphere. The inflation rate consistently accelerates, and recently our central bank declared an interest rate hike. Um, and uh, this will this will translate to issues on employment, food security, oil prices, you know, other things. So yes, domestic issues will be inevitable, which will then behoove the Marcus administration to do a very very delicate balancing act between these issues and foreign and defense issues, not only in the South China Sea but also so the implications of the Ukraine crisis. So, you know, um, it, it will be, again, a wait and see for, for the new Marcos administration. Hopefully, the State of the Nation address on Monday will give us a little bit more light in terms of what exactly he wants to do, what kinds of policies he, he's, he's planning on implementing. Thank you. Um, Gordon, has there been any particular outreach from Beijing towards uh, Yoon's government uh, so far? You're muted. There has, but not successful. Um, uh, this is one of the areas where um, what I was saying earlier really comes into play. Um, you know, Korea suffered at the hands of Chinese economic coercion before Australia did. Uh, and Korean public opinion about China plummeted long before it did here in, in Australia. Uh, and, and so there has been some real issues there at the beginning. The previous administration, though, viewed the relationship with China almost entirely through the prism of needing to keep them on side vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with North Korea. Uh, and, and the fact that that has not been a stated priority for the, the new incoming new administration has meant that you just don't have the same level of prioritization or the same prospects. And so I, I think there's a general uh, consensus that similar to Australia, where there's no desire whatsoever to be uh, unnecessarily antagonistic, uh, there, there is also very little in the way of prospects for a real thaw. Uh, and, and I think Mike put his finger on it, right? That's just not in the nature of the current government in China. Um, it's funny, the Australian media here has been reporting on this is, uh, is there going to be a thaw in the relationship? And I, I, my view is that they've used the wrong temperature analogy. What, what there has been in Australia is, is certainly a reduction in the temperature, right? We've, we've taken a lot of the rhetoric out of the relationship, but you know, it, it, we're reducing the temperature, not thawing it out. You know, the fundamental um, you know, challenges uh, in the relationship remain unchanged, and that remains true between Korea and China as well. Now, Huang, can I jump in on this one quickly? Yes, please, Mike. Um, so um, I don't think it harms U.S. interests for Australia-China relations to improve and coal and wine to begin uh, finding its way into the Chinese market again. It might hurt Napa Valley wine producers in California, but that's not, you know, that's not a core U.S. interest. Um, uh, and I don't think it damages us for uh, Korea to have a productive diplomatic relationship with China and work on the North Korea problem. Um, there's not, you know, there's not a zero sum relationship here. Um, and I think that has to be said clearly. There will be commentators in the U.S. who will argue that, but I don't think that's the U.S. government's position. Um, as long as the alliances are strong and we stand by the same values and we protect the most sensitive uh, technologies. Um, I also think there is something to be said for um, how Japan, Korea, and Australia are now uh, 
probing opportunities with Beijing, because in some ways that uh, debate in Washington has not matured sufficiently. The, the documents coming out of the Biden administration are um, 90, 95% right in my view, but they're missing a really critical piece, which is what does a long-term relationship with China look like? Even the very conservative ruling Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, when it put out its national security policy six months ago, began by stating we seek a productive relationship with China, the most hawkish government uh, on the periphery of China. So I do think there's some merit for the U.S. in having governments in the region probe what's possible. Um, and I think we should be doing it as well. But I think where Gordon and I both are is don't expect Xi Jinping to suddenly decide or the Central Military Commission to suddenly decide that the South China Sea is not a Chinese you know, military district or to decide that um, Australia uh, and the U.S. should be building submarines or, you know, pressuring countries not to criticize uh, China on Xinjiang or Tibet or um, COVID. That, that's just not in the cards. Um, and so there's going to be a real limit. But I think from a U.S. perspective, the fact that the Albanese government's experimenting or experimenting is the wrong word, probing what's possible is not a bad thing. I think the U.S. probably could be doing it a little more than we are right now. I'm glad that you mentioned this thought about zero sum and all the allies have been developing as very sophisticated strategic actors themselves, developing network of relationships. So it's not just a um, relationship like hub spoke type of alliance, but uh, also a relationship with everyone. And it's about, at least in my view, managing relationship with China, not, not having at all. And I think the alliance should be the value um, not because of absence of other relations, but uh, in addition and in spite of it. Um, let's say a little bit um, back, go back to the um, leaders, uh, the theme of our webinar. So um, under the President Trump, um, there, there has been a massive shake in the confidence and reliance about U.S. and U.S. role and stability. It's been um, what, 18 months or so. I think that feeling has gone almost I think it's uh, almost gone, but uh, is it a case? I think it is that shaken confidence uh, gone and um, the, the Biden administration has successfully reassured its uh, allies and partners. Um, that's the question for all of our panelists, but I would like to um, bind it with one of the questions submitted by Ray Powell from Stanford. University asking Charmaine particularly about the Philippines' confidence in the U.S. alliance and its ability to deter China's aggression in the West Philippine Sea. And Ray also asked what um, new and different action would you recommend the U.S. government to take to reassure the Philippines in, in particular? So, uh, yeah, let's, let's start with um, the whole panel and we'll come back to uh, Charmaine uh, specifically on, on the Philippines. But yeah, I wonder um, what are your takes from that transition and how smoothly has the U.S. regained confidence among its allies? Um, Ian, do you want to start first? Um, I'll just note that, uh, you know, there's this sense that you know uh, that the Trump years were a, an interruption to normal TV broadcasting, and we can all relax and not adjust our television set because the normal kind of comfortable bipartisan um, blobbish foreign policy has has resumed with uh, President Biden. Um, there will be new elections before too long, uh, and there are still very significant uh, reasons to be concerned about the the re-election of, of uh, President Trump. So I suspect that not too many. Uh, nations or political parties and leaders will be riding off that possibility and, and sort of banking on a Biden-ish uh, or blob-ish kind of um, constancy in US foreign policy over the next decade or so. Well, Mike's in Washington, so he can give us kind of the on-the-ground perspective, but I will note that almost every conversation I have, both here in Australia, I was in India last week in India with my friends in Korea in Japan, uh, really echo what Ian has said. There is a kind of snapback sense of normalcy, uh, uh, but this deep anxiety. And, and to be honest, it's actually being fostered by something which is fundamentally a good thing. Uh, the, the reporting coming out of the January 6th uh, uh, committee in, in, in the U.S. Congress, it, on the one hand, is it, encouraging because it shows the process working the way it should. 
but the information they're revealing just tells you how fragile uh, arguably the U.S. democratic system is and how close we came to, to a real nightmare scenario. Uh, and, and when you overlay that uh, with, with Biden's low approval ratings, uh, concern about the upcoming midterm elections, there really is a sense that the United States uh, um, you know, is, is somewhere where we all hope uh, it, that it remains kind of in a normal, more normal sphere, but there are scenarios in which things like that don't happen. So there, you know, there is deep-seated anxiety. I think, and not just in this region, but globally. Well, um, the um, question was: Are allies and partners reassured by uh, President Biden? And the answer is not completely. Um, you know, I, to praise another think tank's work, I thought the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index was a pretty good indicator of that. Um, the Biden administration's uh, power index for diplomacy went way up from Trump, not surprisingly. On economic influence, it went down. <laughs> I think a lot of allies and partners think the Biden administration may actually be more protectionist than Trump. Uh, the Trump administration actually renegotiated the U.S.-Canada-Mexico agreement. It was worse in some ways, but it had a digital trade chapter, which was new and important. It did a similar deal with Japan. It wasn't much, but um, uh, but the view in the region that the Biden administration's, you know, losing influence even beyond Trump on the economic statecraft sounds about right. Um, so uh, some reassurance, some concerns. At the same time, you know, um, uh, in in Washington. Um, I, and I, I was born in this town and grew up here and have been in, this, in the blob for a long time. I have never, ever seen more bipartisan consensus in the U.S. Congress or broader consensus in the U.S. Congress or in think tanks or in public opinion polls about the importance of Asia and the importance of alliances. So what happened in the Trump years was at times President Trump was extremely disruptive. In, in my view, the most disruptive thing he did in Asia, Gordon may agree, was when he said in front of Kim Jong-un he would like to withdraw U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula someday. I mean, talk about onside goal. But what happened next? Um, his own administration, uh, working with Republicans in Congress, um, slipped into the Defense Authorization Act, an amendment that said he can't do it, can't spend the Congress's money to withdraw troops from Korea without congressional permission. So we're not a parliamentary system. We, we, we have three branches of government. The founding fathers designed this dysfunctional at times system of government to prevent a king. And sometimes it comes in pretty handy. So um, I would just say there's been more continuity than disruption when you look back at it. That said, what Gordon said about the January 6th hearings, is pretty, pretty scary. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a near run thing. It was pretty bad. I'm of the view that the system would have worked, but we've, it's the closest we've come since the American Civil War to having a real constitutional crisis in this country. And so it's pretty hard to sweep that under the rug and say everything's fine. But I do think if you look at the, the nature, the way the US political system is designed in our constitution and the it's very broad support for um, international engagement, especially with Asia and especially with allies, I've never seen that before. So it's a, it's a mixed picture. Uh, it's not a, you know, it's not, um, it's not just all about Trump, agency and structure. Thank you, Charmaine. Thanks, um, Huang. Um, we've had previous discussions about uh, regional perceptions um, of, of extra regional powers. Um, and I think it's actually time to update those studies that we've done um, in, in the past. Um, but um, let, let me speak very quickly about um, a study that, that we have done in, in, in the Philippines. And this was published in 2020 at the height of um, the Trump administration. And interestingly, uh, we found that despite the Duterte administration's pivot to China and despite the policies of the Trump administration, only 27.6% of our respondents in the Philippines preferred China as a security partner. The top three choices were actually Japan, the United States and Australia. So it just gives you an indicate these numbers, you know, indicate that trust towards the United States remained um, very, very high. And this was consistent with Wong's study and the IC's use of Ishak um, study on um, perceptions on uh, of the region. The numbers can also explain why at the end of uh, Duterte's term, he swung very close once again to, to the United States. 
But that being said, you know, just because there are these high trust ratings um, concerning the United States, um, there are, of course, still issues that the alliance should should focus on. And this is um, addressing Ray, Ray Powell's um, question. The free and open Indo-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific economic framework are all very welcome moves from the perspective of the Philippines. But apart from this, um, cybersecurity and information campaigns are emerging, but critical issues. Actually, I would argue that these are um, these areas are of alarming importance and therefore strengthening cyber infrastructures is badly needed. And that's something that the alliance can can um, also focus on. Certainly, uh, certainly one of the newer way to rehabilitate uh, the alliance. Ian, I have a question to you from John Blacksland. Um, so Indonesia isn't the US ally, but it ha has security agreements with Australia and has a uh, pretty relationship with China, not notably over the Natuna um, Islands. Uh, and uh, the question is, what implications of AUKUS and Quad and the US-Australian relations um, have to own with Indonesia? And can the new Albanese government uh, make more of the relationship? Um, and can uh, the US help in it? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that Indonesia would look to Australia for help managing the Indonesia-China relationship. Um, because there would be an argument or perhaps a perspective that um, perhaps we ourselves haven't done the best job of managing our relationship with China um, as we might have in the last few years. Um, as others have pointed out, there are other states in the region with very long-standing disputes with China who, who have had essentially a better relationship with Beijing than Australia has in the last three or so years. Um, yeah, I, look, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, I, I, my, my sense is that um, Indonesia, like many other countries in, in the region, are trying to figure out what it is that other regional countries want. And I think Japan probably has a slightly better articulated um, vision of that, of, of the, the constructive relationship with China um, while managing differences. Um, but we don't have yet, that yet from the Australian government, uh, or at least the new Australian government. So um, it might be a little bit premature until we see a bit of a track record and a bit of a, a pattern emerging from Canberra as to, to speculate as to what how other countries might look at that and then think about bringing that into their own strategies. Well, can I chime in on this real quick? I know we're almost out of time, but I, I mean, I was encouraged by a very early visit by Prime Minister Albanese uh, uh, and by our foreign minister to Indonesia. Uh, can, according to the, the, the importance of that next door neighbor of ours, uh, but the big picture thing goes kind of back to the broader theme here. Um, um, Korea and Japan in particular, and increasingly Vietnam or I Indonesia, uh, or India rather, all look at Indonesia with kind of an opportunity-based lens. Uh, they see the population, they see the demographics, they see the, you know, you know, the, the tremendous change that's taking place with that society. Australia still is largely um, inhibited by looking at Indonesia through a threat-based lens, right? Uh, and so there's an awful lot that we have to learn from other countries in the region in approaching Indonesia. And I think we've ta taken some pretty good steps in the first six weeks of a new government, but there's a lot more work to do as, as John will rightly know. So John, thanks for that question. We're almost out of time, but if you allow me one last question, lightning round uh, to go to every one of you. If you can give me your key um, so-called indispensables uh, in the next phase of alliance, how to best revitalize the alliance, what are the indispensable ones? Is that the conditionality of like-mindedness? Um, so the question of you know, strategic uh, convergence, um, in the context, for example, like Mike mentioned, you know, neutrality is not an option, for example, for the Philippines, should the contingency um, happen in, in, in Taiwan? So the similar coordination and like-mindedness. Is it a condition of democracy um, and robust democracy in, in our, um, uh, our like partners? Because we do see some sort of pattern and disparity that for some reasons, Northeast Asian and Australia 
unless uh, relations with the US are growing stronger, whereas in Southeast Asia, we hope uh, there's a new chapter under Marcos, but with Thailand, um, these two allies tend to um, uh, grow a little bit further apart with the US. Uh, so I wonder what do you consider indispensable in the good alliance relationship going forward from now on, looking into the future, uh, if we want to look at the next 70 years, for example. So uh, let's go around. Mike, can we start with you? Yeah, um, I would say that what's indispensable is actually um, capacity, uh, capabilities. Um, with the Philippines, if, the, if Manila wants neutrality and has the ability to defend its maritime domain, that, that, that brings us all security. If India is slow in the quad to keep up with US, Japan, and Australia, but India has the, the capacity to sanitize the Indian Ocean, that gives us all more security. Um, so, so for every state in the region, if they have the capacity to defend themselves, to defend their interests, if they have the resilience, um, that's a win. Um, and alignment and, and flags on the table as we have meetings is, is important, but in some ways, making sure states have capacity is the most important, most indispensable thing, I'd say. Thank you. Ian. Uh, I think we are well overdue to think uh, very long, hard, and with sober judgment about the possibility of a fourth Taiwan Strait crisis. Um, I think in Australia, there's been far too much said about this um, very quickly without real uh, sober thought about the kind of risks that it will involve. Um, so there's a need for us to think very carefully about that, how it might unfold, what expectations would be, and indeed what kinds of policies we would be urging on the US if that were to break out. Thank you, Charmaine. Well, what's indispensable, I think, is to tap the bilateral and the regional levels. While improving state-to-state -state relationships remains very important, partners should still find ways to work with and perhaps continue to recognize the centrality of um, ASEAN. Despite its faults, I would argue that it still has value. Thank you. Gordon, last look to you. Yeah, the, the gaping hole in the region it isn't security or diplomacy, it's, it's, it's trade and investment. Uh, and so the real indispensable thing right now is the United States to return, not even to leadership, to participation in the discussion about how we organize trade and investment in this region. That's what's that's most noticeably missing uh, and is really essential for all the rest of the stuff to continue in a meaningful way. Well, thank you so much. It's been really very interesting discussion. We uh, That's all time we have, but thank you so much for being here today and unpacking and giving us realistic expectations and assessments of the new um, uh, leaderships in those countries. Uh, of course, there's still a lot to unpack as things uh, unfold, so please watch this space. The, uh, the Purdue Asia Centre will hope to bring you more of this kind of events and discussion. So uh, please stay tuned for our new uh, events and, and um, webinars. And please uh, join me to thank our panelists as well as our audience participation. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>